In this section of the book, The Symbolic Species, Terence Deacon talks about the ways in which the human brain is suited to human language. And he gives us uh, a number of um, sort of detailed descriptions of different aspects of brain development and brain structure. I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail of that, but I want to kind of give you the big picture of, of how he sees that fitting into uh, the way language functions and the origin of language. So the first things that he does is sort of, s sort of dispel some notions about the brain uh, that he wants to uh, clear away before he can get into the specifics of how he thinks that the brain is organized to suit itself for language. And the first thing he wants to talk about is the, is the issue of brain size because he wants to dispel this idea that, uh, the, that the human brain or that the language ability is a product of a general intelligence of the brain, sort of a general increase of brain size and general intelligence. He wants to try and figure out more specifically you know, what kinds of brain structures would be the ones that are suitable for language. So, uh, so he talks about the ways in which the human brain is larger than uh, other mammals and other primates, but he wants to talk about the specific ways in which it is larger, right? So, um, so the, the first thing he wants to indicate is, is how generally primates have um, comparatively larger brains than non-primate mammals. And uh, what he indicates here is that there's a kind of a shift in uh, brain size from, from, from other mammals to primates in which uh, there's a, a kind of sh shift in the ratio of brain size to body size that's larger from the very beginning of embryo development. And he compares this with the kind of shift you get uh, with dogs. And so, you know, you, there's, there's so what, what the issue here is, the, is the, com the comparative size of the brain compared to the body, right? And, you know, um, you know, the, you know, the largest brains um, in the world or, you know, that we know of are, are you know, amongst, uh, you know, things like elephants and whales who have very large bodies. And that's, uh, that doesn't translate necessarily to more intelligence, but what it translates into is the idea that the more body you have, the more brain circuits you need in order to manage that larger body. So naturally, the, the larger the, the animal, the larger the brain is going to have to be in order to manage all of the processing of, of the sort of sensory and motor, uh, you know, needs of that larger body so that the larger brain isn't necessarily an indication of more intelligence. So, you know, what, what he indicates then is, is what's really important is what he calls encephalization, which is the degree to which uh, the brain to body ratio is large, is that you have a larger brain compared to, comparatively for the size of the body you have. And what he, uh, what he shows then in this chapter about brain size is that primate brains from the beginning are generally larger in embryonic development compared to their body size, right? And, and it's important that it's, it's from the beginning because it's going to influence then the way that the brain develops in relationship to the body. In contrast to what you have w w w in the, what he calls the chihuahua effect, right? Where you've got dogs that are, they basically have the same size brain. All dogs have the same size, basically the same size brain. But obviously there's breeds that are very big, you know, you've got the Great Danes when you've got the Chihuahuas. And so the Chihuahuas have, compared to their body size, a very, very large brain uh, as opposed to other dogs. But they're not, you know, comparatively much more intelligent than the other dogs. And so he says that that's a result of th that, that particular brain to body size ratio is a result of a kind of dwarfism in which the brain and the body develop in the embryo of the dog kind of normally or, or like all other dogs, but that the that the, the continuing development of the, of the body has been stunted in the later growth. So that there's actually no difference in the way that the brain interacts with the body and the way the, 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 the brain itself processes these things, right? Whereas with the primates, there is a difference in the sense that that brain to body ratio is, uh, is larger from the very beginning. And so that leads to uh, a, a different structure of the primate brain 
particularly that there's this larger cortex uh, that allows primates, for instance, to do certain things that other mammals can't. And, and the, the particular thing that he focuses on are the aspects when you need to use some information that you have against other information you have. And so you know, one of the tasks that, 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 that he talks about in terms of the experiments about with primates is our task in which, um, for instance, they have to, um, it, it's kind of similar to, to finding food in the jungle, right, where you, you have to sample different places, like, a, you know, like the chimpanzee in the jungle looking for fruit. He has to go to all these different places to look for fruit, where he, if he finds fruit in a particular place, he needs to remember not to go back to that place because he already found the fruit. There's not going to be any fruit there again. So in a sense, if he's just basing things on association, if he finds a fruit, there's a kind of you know, stimulus response. Is, oh, I should go back there to find fruit again, right? But you, he needs to suppress that in order to say, oh, I already found fruit there. I'm not going to go look there again. So there's a, there's a kind of there's a previous experience you had, and you have to suppress that previous experience in a way in order to continue looking for other things. So there's a kind of using information you have uh, against other information that you have. So that's the particular type of um, function that the larger brain um, promotes, right? And so he indicates this about um, body, body size, brain size in primates as being, you know, some a kind of um, consequence of that larger brain size in primates. Next, he talks about the ways in which the human brain can, uh, are, is larger than that of non-human primates. And here, the human brain, in addition to having that sort of plus of other primates, of a, a, a larger brain to body size ratio from, from, from the beginning of embryonic development, the human brain actually continues to grow after birth at a higher than expected rate, um, even after birth uh, and a higher ex than expected rate for the, for the human body size, right? So that, um, again, the, the, the brain size has to be considered in terms of the entire development of the brain in relationship to the body. And here, um, there's, you know, there's, a, there's, there's a sense in which the, the human brain, as compared to other primates, is developing in a way um, that increases a certain section of the brain, and what he calls it the prefrontal cortex, is the prefrontal cortex that, um, th that becomes larger and larger through this development in infancy and beyond, so that there is a kind of structural difference in the way human brains are, um, uh, appear then or, and, uh, and, and relate to the body than, uh, than another primate. So specifically, I mean, he indicates, and he'll be indicating later on, I'll get to this in a moment, how uh, human brains have many more circuits again in that prefrontal cortex, um, and so we're going to get to the details of that in a moment. But but right now, just the the idea is that it, it, the brain and uh, and body size are are crucial for his argument, but not in a kind of generic way, but in a specific way that indicates which structures of the brain become more important. So um, just to, to to, to summarize here, this sort of comparative brain size and encephalization can't be, uh, can't be looked at in independently of the kind of processes that led to them, right? So there's these dwarfism in small animal breeds like chihuahuas, there's this embryonic reduction of body growth but not brain growth in, in the primates, and then there's brain growth prolongation in humans without an extension of body growth. So it's, it's as if in humans we had a brain, um, if, if it were you know, if it were a normal kind of primate, we would have a, a really large body, but we don't. And so, so we've got somehow these extra circuits that aren't needed by the, uh, the, that normally wouldn't be needed in a primate body. Okay.